welcome. Um, I hope you all had a really good um, holiday weekend and uh, I didn't uh, film on Saturday and Sunday but I'm back on track from the holiday and uh, <clears throat> I wanted to um, go back to that concept of uh, the wearing the two robes and that I was I gave you two stories uh, from this Gidget dialect um, stories that were collected by John Swanton and um, so I want to continue uh, talking about the cultural tradition of wearing two robes so um, in addition to our traditional stories that were taken early on in the uh, in the 1900 uh, the beginning of that century uh, there was also the explorers that came to the coast uh, that wrote their journals and their diaries and their captain's logs and in those uh, journals um, there was more evidence of the um, the people wearing two robes so it really was exciting discoveries that I, I uh, was having while I was reading these uh, journals and it was I, I vicariously um, experienced those uh, those adventures by reading journals like that but I always wanted to um, read between the lines because these people were people that were coming from Europe and uh, the Spanish they had already gone to um, Mexico which at that time was called New Spain and then the South American countries that they had conquered and um, for you know for a couple hundred years before they even came up north and discovered us so anyway um, <clears throat> uh, many people uh, don't really realize that for the first decade 10 years uh, the Haidas and the people in the southeast Alaska and British Columbia and Washington and Oregon area the Northwest Coast area um, it was the Spanish that came and it was the Spanish for 10 years that uh, the people saw and experienced so um, and then the next group of people were were the British with uh, Captain Cook had come in 1778 and it and then uh, some of the people who were actually on his boat saw the um, that they were getting lots of money for the sea otters so they returned and Dixon uh, was one who had returned and he was the er next earliest one there in Haida Gwaii and um, but the Spanish were still involved and, and they had a big uh, kerfuffle with the Nootka crisis where the Spanish and the British were um, claiming land there in the Nootchanoot area and it caused a, a crisis and um, so anyway the, here are these European nations that are vying for the rights of uh, these areas and so um, there was also the northwest coast or the north the northwest passage that people were rushing to this area to find because there had been a rumor that there was a river that ran through the continent and went over to the Atlantic so anyway the Spanish sent um, uh, an explorer Camano was his name uh, Don Juacito Camano and um, that was in 1792 and uh, Vancouver was along the coast he had, was heading over here and was here 1792 93 94 um, to do the same thing to explore and look for that Northwest Passage as well as uh, negotiate uh, with the Spanish and so Camano was sent all the way up to um, Southeast Alaska in an area that was called uh, Bucarelli Bay and uh, it was named after Bucarelli was a um, uh, 
a leader in um, the New Spain area at the time, and so uh, they named this bay after him. And that's up near the Craig, uh, the Craig area, the Bucareli Bay, which is traditionally a um, now a, a Clinket area, like south um, southeast Alaska. The Haidas were up there, and um, and the uh, Prince, big Prince of Wales um, island there was uh, the lower portion was um, Haida territory, and the and the and the northern area was the um, the Clinket area. So in Craig today, uh, there is um, it was um, the um, Clinkets. So, but at the time that Kamano came, the Bucareli area had Haida um, people there in that territory. And we know that because um, they spoke the same dialect and Kamano recognized that they spoke the same dialect as the people in Haida Gwaii on the northern end of Haida Gwaii. So they, they recognized the, the language similarities. And so we know that they met Haidas in the Bucareli area. So that was Kamano. Um, and so anyway, I, um, I, will, I printed up um, a copy of my manuscript because I do talk about it in, in the upcoming book that I will eventually publish. Um, so while I'm weaving today, I'll talk about Kamano and the um, people he met in his uh, time. But I want to get to weaving. And so um, I am doing a new area with new techniques, and these, this is a strictly a raven's tail techniques now. Like um, when I was doing the black with the tinna, I was really doing um, a lot of nahin techniques as far as connecting um, color areas with uh, a join and covering that join with uh, with uh, the braids, that's very nahin, that's chilkat techniques. Um, so um, what I'm on to now, I'll be doing the lattice pattern, and it's definitely um, purely raven's tail. So I hope you enjoy today's um, weaving. So I have woven past the tree shadow, and I got the black border of the tree shadow. I see I went over four, so here I'm gonna go over two and two. And now I start the two color pattern. I'm doing the lattice. And um, I am following the lattice pattern. And I believe that this is Cheryl's, Cheryl's um, um, a pattern that Cheryl's, uh, Cheryl Samuel has shared with um, the weavers, the Raven's Tail weavers. And um, it was actually the pattern that was on the swift robe. So it's the lattice pattern. And I really like this pattern because when it comes out, I think of um, the interconnectedness of uh, and the bi bilateral and binary uh, systems that we all are part of. So anyway, I've already started it, and I see that I had gone one, two, three, four, four black, and one, two, two blues. So on my pattern, I'm going to look here to see where. There's the four, the four black and the two blues. And then now the next one is um, the pattern will be uh, two black, one blue, two black, one blue. So I'm going to go here and see that it starts with just over two blue. Then two black over four, one blue over four, two black over four, and that's the rhythm, the pattern of, um, of the lattice. So that is what I will do. So here is uh, one 
twine enclosing two warps that will be blue and then I'm going to enclose over four and bring the black forward again over four then over four blue now if you notice all of the elements are over four and that's very traditional when it comes to raven's tail over four for these two color geometric patterns is definitely the norm so two blacks now over one over one blue and that's how it's going to move Okay, so I'm going to stop right there and come back and, and pick up its partners so I don't get too ahead of the partners here. And I like to do that because, um, like I was saying, I know these patterns, so I don't look at the graphs. But um, I'm, it, it, it does help keep things straight if you... Um, have these uh, four four weavers and uh, you keep them coming right behind each other so that you do remember where you were and it's not a difficult thing to pick up um, and remember where where you were and where you should be when it comes to the um, the patterns of the um, spider web and the black weavers. Okay, so I know I have black, white, and the copper on that side. And then enclosing two yellow or two blues. And then I see that I did two. Uh, over four, two, two, over four. So now I know I'm into four. So I'm going to enclose, I'm going to enclose this as four. And then I will do a series of enclosing two. So four times. So two, two. two and two and then the next stitch would be over four but it happens that it runs out there and so it will be uh, two blue okay and then here I enclose over four and then the blue over four and the blue over four and black over four and again be very careful about these over four um, twines because they can squish and it'll affect your your next rows and your next row so it can affect the rest of your robe if you uh, squish them up and uh, they are compressed uh, too much. So, okay, so um, I'm not going to go any further with these two and I'm going to jump over here. Now I'm going to um, I'm going to scoot the camera a little further away from my weaving so you're not going to really see the details but but um, 
I've just explained a lot of that, uh, what I'm doing. So I'll just um, push the camera back and then I'm going to talk a little bit about Camano and the fur trade and what he saw when he came up to Haida Gwaii and to um, the Bucareli area. So let me just move, move you there. There, um, in this row, it was um, over two black. Well, over four, over four black, and then over four blue. Okay, so let's see. So um, the Spanish sent Camano up to the Brucarelli area because they had heard rumors that the uh, Russians were going to be there. And the Russians um, were infringing on the Spanish territory. The Spanish thought they owned the place because in way back in the 1400s, uh, the Pope had declared that the um, Spanish owned half the world or some ridiculous thing, a uh, papal declaration. So anyway, when they heard that the Spanish were coming, I mean, when they heard the Russians were coming, they decided um, they didn't want the Russians up in their territory, and nor did they want the Russians or the uh, British to discover the uh, Northwest Passage. So they wanted to find that Northwest Passage. They wanted to declare their territory uh, theirs. And so they sent their explorers. Uh, Camano came and he went up to, first he went to Bucareli area. And like I said, he noticed that these people were speaking um, Haida. He, he had uh, recognized that they spoke the same dialect. So he found some Haidas up there and they traded with, with the Spanish. The Haidas traded with the Spanish. Um, and then after he went to the Bucareli area, he went down south to the Haida, to the, to Haida Gwaii and to the northern Haida Gwaii area. And, um, and he met them there. Uh, so he went to uh, near the North, North Island, Langara Island is what people sometimes call it. Um, anyway, he goes there because by that time, this is 1792, um, so by that time, um, the, the Americans even got in the picture. So in um, 1786, uh, Captain Gray had gone up to uh, Haida Gwaii and he did a fantastic job of uh, collecting hides from the Haidas and that news got out. So I'm sure the Spanish knew that um, they would be seeing Haidas there and uh, they, that they would trade with uh, the Haidas for their cloaks of sea otter. In fact, the area was called uh, Cloak Bay. I think it might still be called Cloak Bay. But anyway, uh, he traded and he met a chief in, in around the Custa area and it was Chief Gunia. And um, so Gunia came on board, he and his son were the first ones to go on board there um, on the ship. Actually, the ship it was called, um, let me look at my notes, the ship was called Aranzazu, I believe. Yeah, the Aran, Aranzazu. So the Aranzazu came with uh, Camino, uh, uh, the captain, and uh, and what's really interesting, and it is that uh, right here up the street from where I'm from where I'm um, 
weaving is um, a marine museum here in Nasset. And uh, in that museum is a jar that fell off the Aranzanzu. So um, my neighbor, Noel Burton, Stuart Burton, he was um, fishing along that area and his um, net got uh, stuck up on something. So uh, they pulled it up and here was this uh, jar and it was a round bottom jar because I think in the old days they used to set those round bottom jars uh, into, into holes um, that held them in place. And um, just the way that the, the, the ships are always moving, so they had set it up so that, uh, well, that there was round bottom jars. And uh, so someone must have tossed the jar from the Ranzanzu back in 1792. And it was like in the 17, I'm not really sure what year it happened, but it was like the 1760s or whatever, where they pulled up that, that jar. And um, so I get to go down and see something that was on the Aranzanzu. And uh, anyway, it was quite exciting. So, but when um, he came to um, the, um, the area where Kania was a chief, um, he and his, uh, the chief came on to the Aranzanzu and met uh, Camino. So, um, so that's kind of an interesting local, local lore, local history. Um, so it, uh, he meets uh, Chief Kania, and the chief uh, walks up with his son, and uh, chief, uh, Captain Kameno was very surprised when Chief Kania says, uh, Bueno, bueno, to him, right? But that only makes sense because, um, like I said, the first decade, it was just the Spanish that met with us. And so, um, you know, we were picking up their language, they were picking up our language, and um, and the captain, or the chief, was quite uh, uh, probably an, an extremely intelligent man who was good with languages and... Uh, and to, to be diplomatic about the traders and the people that were coming to the coast, um, bueno was uh, a good word to learn. So anyway, um, so he is greeted by uh, the chief, bueno, bueno, the chief says, and so they talk, and, um, and uh, I'm sure it was just hand motions and uh, expressions. But uh, they do communicate, and um, so Camino uh, writes down in his in his uh, journal uh, his impressions of the chief. So I don't want to get it wrong, so I'm going to read. Um, I'm going to read to you what these uh, what Camino uh, had. Uh, what his first observations were. So let me stop and then I'll, I'll read it to you, okay? So, let me, there. Okay, so um, let me get to, okay, first of all, we'll see what he says about the people in Bucarelli Bay, okay? He says, they go modestly dressed as over the tunic made of fine deer skin or of some goods they have acquired that reaches from neck to ankle. Um, they wear a cape made from the skin of sea otter, bear, or other animal that completes their covering. So that was in the journal of uh, Don Facito Camano. And I got that from um, uh, Grenfield and Wagner and Newcomb. So um, I read that in their, their uh, manuscripts. 
So what another thing that was really interesting is that um, Kamano at Bukarili Bay collects a robe. Now I'm going to read the description of the robe that he collected. Okay, it's interesting. Okay, um, I also obtained a cloak or mantle made from the inner wool of the wild goat. This wool is very fine in the thread, well spun and well woven. Narrow strips of sea otter fur are worked into this and are so neatly sewn that the outer side of the garment has the appearance of a whole skin, while nothing is noticeable on the inner side. A flounce is left all around the smaller circumference, deepened at the back, except where the collar is. And so a flounce, I believe, is, they're talking about the fringe, right? Um, <clears throat> this is well twisted and rolls over for about nine inches, made also of strips of nutria fur. The back part is decorated with various figures or patterns of a purple color. Altogether, this cloak is quite the best piece that I have seen made by them. So um, when he talks about purple, purple is not a traditional color around here. So I, what I'm thinking is that he probably saw an older robe uh, with um, the color black it had been produced by Hemlock or Hemlock and Alder. And that, in my research in museum pieces, a lot of these um, ro old robes, you'll see the black uh, borders are really a deep um, brown, uh, red, reddish brown. So I'm thinking that that's the color that uh, Kamano had seen with that old robe. So he collected it. But they're, uh, by, like a lot of the things the Spanish collected, um, they were very secretive and um, so a lot of the things that they collected were um, lost. And um, one of my fantasies in, um, is that someday I'll go to Madrid and find a Raven's Hill robe that nobody had discovered before and that had been collected on these earlier um, expeditions and stuff. But, and I'll say um, Spain and not New Spain because I know that um, a lot of um, these things that were collected by the Spanish uh, were sent to Spain and not really deposited with New Spain. Um, but anyway, it's either New Spain or Mexico or it's in, in, in Madrid, Spain. So I'd love to go and discover. <laughs> but anyway, um, so he goes, he travels from Bucareli Bay and then he goes down to Haida Gwaii in the North um, Island Langara area. So um, anyway, so here is him talking about meeting uh, Chief Kania of Kusta. The Samoa gets, and that's um, that's a Simsian word for a chief. So obviously Kamano has had some experience or somebody on the boat had some experience with, um, with uh, the Simsian language. So he's describing, but he is in Haida Gwaii and he is describing the Haida chief. He's uh, dressed, con his dress consisted of wide breeches made of light blue gray serge and a large cloak formed of marten skins. This latter is the distinguishing mark of a village chief and was ornamented with a great number of extra tails. His son was the first to speak, pointing me out as captain of the ship to his father, who then saluted me and asked leave to come on board. This granted, he at once mounted the side, walked aft to me and gave me his hand. Then gently touching my face with both hands, he said, bueno, bueno. And this was the first time that I had seen this form of friendly greeting used by the Indians, but no doubt they had learned it from intercourse with the Europeans. And so, um, so that is his uh, first introduction with Chief Kania. But later, I think maybe the next day, um, the chief comes on board again. So Kania came on board at five o'clock that evening or maybe it is the same day and it's that evening. 
He is of a very big frame and stout in proportion with a handsome face and is about 70 years old. His clothing, all of sky blue, consisted of two house folk, two loose frocks, one over the other, ornamented with Chinese cash, each one strung on a piece of sail-making twine with a large blue, light blue glass bead the size of a hazelnut, a loosely attached loosely attached to the material and together forming a button. So <clears throat> we have um, his clothing all of sky blue consisted of two loose frock coats. Okay, so then he goes on and, and describes those coats, what he calls coats. So um, his breeches in the form of trousers were also trimmed with many of these cash so that he sounded like a carriage mule as he walked. He had on a frilled shirt and wore a pair of unlike silver buckles, not, however, in his shoes, but at the feet of his trousers. The trimming of his clothes were formed by the selvage of the cloth, and this made up for the lining, which was altogether lacking. So anyway, when I read that, um, I think that it has enough clues that makes me believe that those overcoats, those two loose frocks that he describes as loose frocks, were really two robes. And the way he describes it as um, um, hung on a piece of sail making twine, that's what makes me think that these were uh, mountain goat robes woven um, in a traditional manner. Because he talks about no lining. So if it was a European coat, he would have said it's a European coat. And, but he talks about it as here is these overcoats that have no lining, but they do have um, the selvage and the fringe. Um, so, and he talks about the um, heading cord being a uh, sailor twine. And in my research, one of the first uh, things that the people uh, adopted were when they had this new material. Um, so when I pull out robes from the past that are in now in museums, I see that traditionally the Nahin robes were um, had the um, leather heading cord. And, uh, and then these robes would have um, the warp, some uh, warp as heading cord. Um, but um, then uh, it's a lot of these robes started having uh, sailor twine or cotton twine. And, and then we know that they had picked up this material from trade. So uh, it's very interesting, this um, passage of of Camanos and uh, the description. So anyway, um, like I was saying, I think in a previous uh, a previous uh, video that I had gone, to, I had been awarded a fellowship with Yale University, and I'd gone, um, I'd gone there and um, uh, studied these original uh, paintings by Sigmund Backstrom. So when he in, 19, in 1792, when Camano came, uh, the very next year, 1793, Sigamus Backstrom came along that coast and met Kania, and he painted a portrait of Kania. So, uh, and and um, and so this uh, first description of him wearing a uh, uh, a coat that uh, a fur coat, and then um, and then the uh, trousers, the trade trouser, trousers and buckles on his trade trousers. But anyway, um, so he, both Kamiya, Kam, Kamiya and uh, both Camino and uh, Sigmund Backstrom, both of them uh, were documenting uh, what people were wearing at that time. And, uh, and it was a mix of, of trade but it also was uh, robes that were traditionally worn even pre-contact. So it, it's really exciting, this research that I'm doing, and I'm hoping that we're going to get this um, published and that it will be shared with everybody um, 
what we wore pre-contact and at the very first uh, couple decades of of um, of the um, introduction to European cultures and things like that. So, <clears throat> thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope we didn't go too long. I think we did. <laughs> I might have to uh, nip and tuck some of this video, but thank you very much. Bye.